years. And one of the things I've come to find is when I started using IronCAD, I was able to model a lot faster than I could in using any other modeling. Uh, let me get, get into that. There we go. Tell you a little bit about CAD Concepts. CAD Concepts has been selling CAD software since PCs have been invented back in 85. Uh, we've been selling pretty much most of the leading packages today. Um, we, In the early days of the 80s and 90s, uh, we were responsible for taking a lot of companies from the drafting board over to the, uh, over to the computer. Um, I personally have trained hundreds of uh, users in AutoCAD products, SolidWorks products, IronCAD, and, and, and other CAD-related programs. So I kind of have a good feeling for uh, what CAD is all about and have been modeling since the mid-80s uh, using Bullion and wireframe modeling back in the old AutoCAD days and before we had anything else. The thing that I found with early modeling and including the modeling that goes on today is that everything is based in 2D. In, in, the, in the old CAD days we were drawing in 2D and that was all fine. And when we moved into modeling, we kind of took that same technology over to the models. We, we would start our models with 2D sketches. We would extrude them. We would revolve them. <clears throat> but it was still basically 2D. We were still taking our 2D stuff into our, our modeling environment. Well, with IronCAD, what I found was I could use shapes instead of profiles. So if I wanted a cube, I'd just drop a cube on my desktop. I didn't have to worry about what work plane I put it on. Um, it, it was just a cube. So in, in the IronCAD, we call them IntelliShapes. So that was one of the first things that I found was a productivity a speed enhancement for me. Uh, the other thing was the tri-ball. The tri-ball is used to move. If you put a hole in a part uh, or you have a, a piece of a part that you just created, you can actually move those things with the tri-ball whereas in the other programs I had to use constraints. If I wanted two blocks to be next to each other I actually had to mate them together in a collinear, coplanar kind of a constraint and it, it was stuck together. Uh, if I wanted to move it later I had to, I had to re release the constraint and, and move it to another area using constraints as well. The tribal I can move things around and with no constraints whatsoever. Uh, the only time I need constraints is if I'm trying to make a, a, an assembly move. And, and I'll kind of show you some of that later on. Um, now, smart attachment points were an, another uh, enhancement to me is when I'm creating an assembly, if I'm creating an assembly and, and, and the pieces go together in the same place all the time, uh, I can put attachment points on it so I don't have to even use the tri ball to position it. I just put it close to each other and the, and the two parts snap together in the proper orientation. So if I create a, a, an assembly of parts in, from catalogs, uh, they just snap together and you're going to see some of that as well. The other, the other in, uh, speed enhancement for me was the catalogs. In, in our 2D world, we, we always talked about libraries. We had a, a library of 2D shapes that we would just drag and you know, hopefully drag in. We can now drag them into our our program years ago we had to insert them. Uh, now uh, our libraries are called catalogs in, in the IronCAD world. Uh, in, the, in the Compose product all, all the programs out there have viewers. AutoCAD has viewers, SolidWorks has viewers, everybody has a viewer so you can view the, the part that was created uh, in the uh, solid environment. However Compose goes beyond that and I like Compose because not only was it a free viewer where I could view the, 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 the solid image that I created, the part or assembly, but it, it allowed me to do a configuration and you're going to see some of that. So if I created a library, a catalog of, of, of different parts with Compose, I could send that catalog to maybe a sales, sales guy or a distributor and he could use that catalog to actually build a configuration on screen and it's all free. So it, it goes beyond uh, just viewing. Uh, it also allows animations and uh, some, some, some basic rendering. So it was, it's a lot more than just a basic viewer. So with that, let me switch over to my IronCAD and we'll get started. 
what you're seeing here on the screen is very similar to some of the other programs. Left side, this is how I drive it. I, I like my, 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 my scene browser to be on my left and my catalog to be on my right. That's, that's mainly because I've got more screen width going left to right than I do top to bottom. So for me, it works out. <clears throat> so what you're seeing on the right side of the screen is the catalog browsers. And you can have a lot of different catalogs configured. Uh, and these are just a fraction of what's available. Some of these are actually custom catalogs. And you're going to actually see that as I go along. But what I wanted to remind everybody of was how we used to do things in the 2D world. Prior to IronCAD, <coughs> excuse me, if we wanted to create a part, we would do something like this. We would have to create a sketch. And if I go in and, and edit that sketch, you'll see what I mean. So I would have to create this sketch, spend the time, lock the corners down so that when I change the dimension, it moved in the right direction. Uh, dimension everything in the right place and then when I was finished I would extrude it and we'll just show you how that's done I'm going to create a standalone part and it, there's the profile I'm going to extrude it to one inch and there's my part now the downside to doing that is everything is locked to the sketch if I want to change things I've got to edit the sketch. Now, and that was great when that's all there was. And we were moving from the 2D world. That's, that was familiar to us. But as you move into the 3D world, if you really want to get speed out of it, you need to model differently uh, than we used to. And what I found was IronCAD actually models the way I think. For instance, <clears throat> if I wanted to create this same part over again, <clears throat> I would figure, let me just take a block with the left mouse dragging and dropping on the screen. And if you notice over on the right left side, the part number two is highlighted. If I click on it again, you'll see that the block that was used to create that, the shape that was used to create that block is now highlighted. And what you're seeing are the handles. So you can actually reshape that block in any direction you want or do a right click on it and edit the size box. So I'm going to make that eight by six by one. And now I've got another shape that I can work with. Well, I want to, I, I want to cut these corners out, just like we did on the other. Now, again, if, if you think about it when, it, when you look at that, you say, well, what I want is I want to cut out. So I go to my catalog, just grab a, the opposite of a block, which is a square hole, drag it, drop it on the corner, and now I've got a cutout. Okay, but you want you want to make that accurate. So what, what I do is I can grab this handle, touch it against the side, and now it's even with that side. Do the same with the other. So now I've got the outer edges of that whole block, uh, coplanar, if you will, with the outside edges. So now I want to create the actual size. So if I click on the handle, in the direction that I want it to go, I can type 1.5 in that direction, and I want it to go one unit in that direction. So now that's the way I think. I want to cut out, I just drop it, and it's right there. Now, <clears throat> I, I could continue that and just keep dropping things and then and then changing changing the uh, the handles, but I want to make this a little bit smarter than than just dropping individual handles. I, you know the way the older part was done everything is individual so that if you want to change one thing it only changes that one uh, that one part so I want to get rid of those and I'm going to highlight that one square hole piece again and I, now I'm going to introduce you to the tri ball this is the tri ball the it has multiple uh, handles on it and the, the way this works is you've got the outside handles if you want to move it in a linear direction using using the handles and you can type in the direction you want to go you can also if you notice the little hand with the rotation I can actually rotate that part inside the, the tri ball now what I want to 
you want to do now. Let me do two things. The outside handles are more directional. Uh, in the Z direction, the X direction, the Y direction. The inside handles are more for orientation. So if I right click on the inside handles, you'll see that I can actually make those inside handles perpendicular to edges and perpendicular to faces. I can move them to center points and I can actually interact with another part that is part of an assembly which is something other programs don't do. If you're working on a particular part, you can't actually sometimes reference other pieces of the assembly, which I can do with the tri ball. Now, if I wanted to move this little square hole, I want to move it in a direction from a, from a known point. That's the big thing about the modeling, uh, is you, you want to put things, and you always want to start from a known location. So many times you need to move the tri ball within the uh, the shape itself and the way you do that is you you hit the space bar and I've now unlocked this unlocked the tri ball so I can now move it and I want to move it to a point and I want to move it to a point on that edge so now I hit the space bar again now I can actually do a right click on the inner handle and I say I want to mirror it but I actually want to mirror it with a link so now I've got two two cutouts that are identical but yet they're also controlled uh, they, they change with each other so now I've got two holes well I, I want two more on the other side so I highlight one use my shift key highlight the other and then turn on my tri ball and now the tri ball will actually work on both of those uh, uh, features but now I need to move it so that I can mirror it uh, on the other side hit my space bar again go to the inside dot now I want to mirror it between a face and a point so I pick that I here's my face and then here's my point so it now moves it so I don't even have to know distances or or what dimensions were I just have to pick things and again it's working the way my my mind tends to think so I lock the tri ball back in place again click on the inner circle or the inner dot now I want to mirror it again but I want them to be linked. So now I've got four cutouts, but they're all linked together. So if I were to change one, they're all going to change. So again, that's saving a lot of time. Now, in, in if <clears throat> if you remember the old uh, the old profile, I had to sketch those holes. Now with with the IronCAD, I'm going to just drop them. But the first thing I want to do is I want to blend some of these corners and this blending technique is pretty much like like all the others so there's nothing really spectacular here other than it it blends and I'm going to create a 0.75 blend and I want to pick the reason I picked wireframe was so I could actually see through the part there, there are other ways of doing this but I, I just kinda like going into the wireframe it's just, it's just easy for me because I can remember to do that Let's do another one, and we're going to change the outside curves. There are ways, if you like working in shaded view, there are ways of hitting certain special keys where you could actually grab right through the part. Um, but I always forget what the keys are. So, but I know what wireframe, and I know wireframe is there, so I just go right to wireframe. Now, I want to put a hole. Well, where do I want to put a hole? I just go get my hole, which is the opposite of a cylinder. I get my whole cylinder, drag it, and drop it right on that dot and change that to 0.5. Now, if I'm not concerned about this, you know, th those being linked, I could just continue dropping, dropping holes where I want them. I want to show you how I link them together in another uh, example coming up. But there are my holes and my hole for the center. Again, I don't have to worry about finding the center. I just drag, drop, and it illuminates. And then there's my center. So now I've, I've created that part using shapes and then have to worry about a profile. However, if I do want to build something that is not quite, uh, I don't have a shape that fits it, I can still do that. So let me drop another block down here, click on it again, 
go edit the size. I highlight that part. What what you also notice, I don't know if you if you're familiar with other systems, is I actually have multiple parts in the same scene. In some of the other programs, you can't do that. Um, you've got to create the part, save it, create another part, and save it. And if you wanted to build an assembly, you have to open an assembly file and then insert these parts into the assembly. With IronCAD, I don't have to do that. So what I'm going to do now is, if you notice, it's got a cyan color. That's that's in that's in the the uh, the shape mode. But if I click on it again, it goes into the block mode. Well, that block is actually made up of a cross section. So I can actually go in and edit the cross section. So the, the, the profile, if you will, or the cross section is still there, but the shapes have been done to save you the, the steps of having to go in, in and modify or actually create a profile. So here I'm going to do an ellipse, connect it there, at the top, and then the sides. So now I'm done with my ellipse. I'm going to create the polyline there. I want to click from here, do a right click, enter. So now that's down one unit. Now it's if you notice it is it is uh, horizontal. So I'm just going to click it there. Now without doing knowing anything, I just want to mirror this so everything is symmetrical. So I'm going to pick the line that I want to mirror. And you see that the line is selected here. And all I have to do now is to check the axis that I want to mirror the, that line about, and it brings it down to the bottom. So once I'm finished with that, I now have some lines that I need to get cleaned up a little bit. So I go to my trim command, and I start removing the lines that I don't want. And there were actually two lines there. You do need to remember, you need a closed profile to, cr to create any kind of an extrusion. So that's my new profile. So I didn't have a shape that actually fit that. So, so sometimes you will have to go in and you will have to make modifications to the profile. And when you're finished, I now have the profile that I'm working with. And again, going back to my blend command, it's still a half inch. Let me switch back to my wireframe. It, like anything else, there is always more ways, more than one way to complete a part. <clears throat> now, if you notice earlier, I dropped individual holes. Well, in this case, I'm going to drop an individual hole. But now I want those holes to be linked together so that if I do change the diameter of the hole, I want them all to change. So it's going to save me some time. So let me turn my tri-ball on because the tri-ball again allows me to make copies of that hole. Go into the center point. Tell it I want to make copies. I want to make linked copies. So now what I do is I just, with my left mouse, get that, drag it, snap to where that hole I want to be. I hit P for place, drag it to the other edge, hit P for place, P for place, hit enter, and now I'm finished. Now all those holes are linked together. And that, and that again saves some time, but this I need still need the center hole, so let me drop a hole there. And now I've created a little different type part by, by modifying the profile. <clears throat> but, but because I, I link these holes together, I can actually come over to my tools catalog, go to my fasteners, and in the tools catalog, you, you've got cold steel, you've got hot form steel, you can extrude, you have gears and helixes and even bearings that you can just specify and it creates the bearing already for you. But in this case, I'm just going to left mouse, drag it, highlight the hole, and let it go. <clears throat> what it's doing now is it's calculating the size of that hole so it knows 
Yeah. There we go. That's go-to meetings giving us that trouble. <clears throat> Notice the nominal size it picked up was 0.5. Um, it, the default was for four inches. I don't really want it to be four inches. I'm going to make that uh, two and a half inches. And I'm going to add a nut on the end of it. But while we're here, let me show you what we've got. You've got different types of bolts. You've got different types of bolt heads, um, parameters. You can heavy, different types of material, brass, copper, aluminum, nylon, uh, how many threads per inch that you might want. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or if you're going to use screws, you can jump over to the screws menu, different uh, types of uh, screw heads, uh, shoulders and whatnot, uh, many different types of nuts. So you can be, depending on what kind of nut you might want on it. The same with washers, you'll have different options for washers. Uh, if you're doing some kind of a cotter pin, you can got that. Or if you're using any kind of locking rings, you can, you, you've got that. And it, any kind of size you want, all the standards are there for you. So let me get back to my bolts, double check everything that I did. Uh, two and a half, uh, 12 per inch, add a nut, and I'm just going to say uh, OK. Now, the, it knows that those, that those were linked uh, holes, so it's automatically going to populate the other linked holes. Now, I left a little room there because I want to do something with the tri ball. I want to take this part, turn the tri ball on, and I want to move this part, like we talked about earlier, without any constraints. Now, I want to move the top of this hole to the bottom of the other hole. So I want to unlock the tri ball, tell it I want to go to a center point, highlight that, and then lock it back in place. Now that it's locked, I can move the whole part by, again, right-clicking on it, picking center point, coming over to here, Flip that over and tell it I want to move it to the center point right there. Now it moved that part with no constraints whatsoever. So you can build assemblies without constraints. The only time I need constraints is if I want to make the assembly move and articulate in some way. Now, here's something I did both the old way and the new way. Someone come from the engineering department comes in and says, hey guys, uh, this is great, but we're going to have to put an O-ring in, in, this, uh, in this part because we want it to be sealed a little better. So I come back to my shapes and I go and I get a torus. And I go for the negative torus because I want the, I want the O-ring slot to be there. So I left mouse, drag that, drop it right there. So there's my O-ring, 0.125. And want it to be 0.125 tall. Turn my tri ball on. Highlight the axis I want to move it. Come down here, and I want to move here. I want to move that 0.25. So I've actually now created a a groove. And I'll highlight that groove with the smart paint. What I just did was I just clicked a few times till, till I got to the face level of that particular feature. So now I've actually added a groove for an O-ring in a matter of seconds. I, I actually did it both ways. In the old way that I would have had to do it uh, in other systems, is I would have had to make a work plane that, that bisects this top, excuse me, the top part vertically. And then I would have had to find the center of this hole and put a axis there for spinning. I would have then had to put construction lines so I could locate a circle at the location I wanted this groove to be. I had to make sure the groove went in as far as I needed it to be. Then I would have had to sweep that, um, that circle with a remove uh, feature to get that part. And I actually did this two ways. And you saw how fast it was with me here. When I timed myself the other day, it took me 24 seconds to create that groove. In the other method, it took me four minutes and 40 seconds to create the same groove. And I actually practiced it a few times so I wasn't fumbling, so I wouldn't be biased in one way or the other. Now, when you think about it, four minutes and 40 seconds, roughly five, almost five minutes, versus 
24, 25 seconds. That just shows you how much faster I'm getting when I start adding up those little pieces, one on top of the other, all of a sudden I'm, I'm adding or I'm, I'm shaving off hours to my assembly times. And it's all about those little little bitty savings and how you know something takes you takes you one or two seconds to do here. It may take you a minute in the old way. That adds up. Now, what about assemblies? You might ask. Well, let me let me throw in here. Uh, let's see here. Let me throw up an empty scene. <clears throat> so right now I've got one scene and I want to build an assembly. So I drop a block. Click on the block. Edit the size block. We'll, we'll do the same size. So now I've got a block. I, I turn my ISO off. I don't like working with ISO on. So I, what I want to do here is I want to create basically a wheel, uh, kind of like a pulley wheel. And uh, I want another block to be on top of this. Now, I would have had to create work planes and sketches to do all of that, but, but you're getting to see it's working like I'm thinking. I want to put a block there. I drag and put a block there. Well, I want that block to, to go across the entire width of the first block. So I just grab that handle, touch the side, and now it's, it's coplanar. Do the same with the other. Just touch the edge. So now I know that's coplanar. Take the back one, touch on that. Now I know that it, it's, it's connected all the way around. But it's not the right size yet. So I click on it again, grab the handle, now, the distance is going to move from that handle. So I want that to be, oh, come on back here. I want that to be one unit. And I also want it to be one unit, one inch, if you will, from the top of that. Now, I want to put a shaft through here. So I, I want to get a little bit fancier. So let me go back to my features, go to my blends. OK, so it's still set to a half. So I. I Blend that end, blend that end, until I'm finished. So now I've got something I could put a shaft through. Uh, but what I also want to do is I want to make an opening for my wheel. So I go back to my H block, drag it and drop it on that dot. Now that's, I know it's the center. And here again, I'm not taking any measurements. I don't have to worry about measurements because everything is already on screen for me. Now what I do is I highlight one handle with my control key, pick the other handle, and now I can move that symmetrically in any direction I, I want it to go. It's kind of like a Windows thing. If, if you grab, use the control key, you can grab two handles. So I want to set that to be 1.5, and I want that to go all the way to this end here. So now it goes there, and I want it to go all the way to, to the surface here. So now I know it's 8 inches, so it's going the full length of that. So now I want it to be six inches, so it goes six inches from that end. But I also want it to cut up so we can put the wheel in. So I'm just going to take this handle, move it up. So now I've cut a hole, a square hole, <clears throat> exactly where I want it to be. But I need to put a shaft. Well, before I put a shaft, let me come under here and put a, a mounting plate. Again, drop the block. And let's let's reshape the block so it fits. Go to there, to that edge, to that edge, and let me make that one. And I want to make that uh, four, so it comes down to four. So now I've got something I could put a block on and mount a block onto it. But let me put a hole for my shaft. So I grab the cylinder, again drop it right in the center. I don't have to measure anything because that's where the, the center is. Indicate that that's 0.5 and just go all the way to the other end. So now I've got a hole that goes all the way through. Again, just that fast. I'd be still working on some of these other pieces in another system if I, if I were using that. But again, I just wanted a hole, grabbed the hole, dropped it, put the shape of the hole I want. Now I need I need some mounting holes, so I've got a slot here. So let me give it. Let me drop a slot, again right in the center. So I it, it to me it's a known location. Let me drag that all the way through so it goes through the part. 
but it's, it's in the wrong direction. Turn the try ball on, lock down the axis that I want to rotate the slot about, with my left mouse just drag down, let it go, but I want to move that 90 degrees. So okay, so now it's moved 90 degrees, but it's not where I want it to be. Let me lock, lock this down, drag this over, and let it go, and I want to move it here, and I want to move that 1.5 inches. So now I've got that. So now we can see that I've got a hole that goes all the way through, but I'm going to need two holes. Highlight that, turn the try ball on, unlock the try ball again, take this and move it to a point right down here. So I know that point is, is the center point between both edges. Turn my try ball, uh, lock my try ball back in again, and I want to link the mirrored copy. So now I've got two holes. They're linked together, but maybe maybe they're a little bit too high. So come back here, click on one, hold my shift key down, click on the other. So now when I turn my try ball on, it's going to perform the operation on both features. Again, lock in my my axis of movement grab it, let it go, and move it here, and move it here, 0.5. So now I move them both kind of where I wanted them to be. All right, so that's that's good. So that's the one, that's one of my parts. <coughs> Excuse me. Now I want to make <clears throat> the axle that this can, can rotate around. So I drag another part. You'll also notice on the screen that I've got two parts, part one and part two. If I had more time and I wasn't talking to you guys right now, I would label these axle and base or whatever. And so I want to make this 0.5. And I'm not too concerned about its length right now, but I may want to change its color just to differentiate it from, from the other work. So now let me highlight that again. It's not at the right angle for me, so I want to rotate it. I highlight the, the part, type 90. So now it's it's at it's facing the right direction. Get my try ball back on again. Go into the center dot, and I tell I want to move that to the center point of that hole. So now I know its placement and it's placed correctly. But again, no constraints were made. So if you notice on the side of the screen here, there are no constraints. So now I just highlight this. Take this edge, touch it to there, take this edge, touch it to the surface there, so now I've got my part number two. So now I need a wheel. So let me go back to my shapes, drag another cylinder, drag it out here, and this one I'm going to make eight inches by one inch. And again, you know, I want to make sure that I can differentiate it from the color of the others, so I just I hit it with that. Highlight the part, highlight the uh, try ball, turn it on, lock down the axis I want of my rotation, left mouse. So now I've got it. it. It's sort of a wheel, but it's a solid wheel. That's not what I want. I want it to make it a little lighter. So I come down here and I I want to put some 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 slice openings in it, kind of like a pie, but but I want to make a whole pie. So I drag that, drop it into the center, and so now I've got something that resembles a pie, but it doesn't go all the way through. Highlight that, drag this out, so now I go all the way through. But it doesn't have, does, it didn't leave me any room to put an axle through there. So what I do is come over here, highlight this, right click, and actually come over here. I want to edit the cross section first. I'll come back to the right yeah. click there. So edit the cross section. Oh, wrong part. There we go. Part number three. There we go. So I want to give myself a little bit room, a little room to make a hole. drag this out, step it to that, finish that. So now I've got room to put a hole. 
So I can then come over here, got a cylinder, drop it, make a 0.5. So I'm beginning a wheel. But I, I you know, it's not kind of what I've finished yet. So let me highlight that that's that slice, turn my tri ball on, lock down my center axis, do a right click and drag and let it go. It allows me to create a radial pattern. Well in this case I want four of them and I want them spaced 90 degrees apart. So now I've got a wheel but I want them to go a little closer to the edge. So I hit F7 key and make that perpendicular to the screen. Go back to my uh, my pattern, let me get to my pattern. There it is. And we want to make it a little bit bigger. So okay, so good. So we got it there. Now I want to put the put the wheel in the in the center of that. But before I do that, if I look at the wheel, it's got a flat surface on it. So if I put some kind of a rope or a belt over that, it's not going to stay on very easily. So what I want to do now is I want to go back to my torus, drag the torus, and drop it in the center. And I want to make that, uh, well, for the moment, okay, so make this, uh, make that one unit, but that's not where I want it to be. So let me highlight that torus again, turn the tri ball on, and if we notice that the, tor the tri ball is on the center of the torus, so I want to move that <clears throat> I want to move that in we'll grab this handle move that 0.5 and turn my face in this direction And I want to drag that out so it gives me a little bit of a groove. So now if I turn this around, so now I've made myself a little bit of a groove for a belt or a rope to fit into and it won't slip off so easily. Now let's put it in place. Highlight the part I want to move, turn the tri ball on, and let's double check to see where the tri ball is. The tri ball is on the back side. I'd like it to be in the center. So <clears throat> Highlight the axis, drag it. Oops, I need to un unlock the tri ball. Drag it, move here, 0.5. So now I know the tri ball is in the center. So now I want to make that the center point right there. So now we know that it's, it's on the center of where that hole is. So it's in the right position. Again, all without constraints. <clears throat> However, I need to make it and put it in the center. So let me highlight it, turn the tri ball on. Now if I go into the little dot in the center, do a right click, I want to move that between a face and a point. So I want to pick this face, well, let me lock this axis in before I do that. Otherwise it will move. So I want to lock that in uh, between a face and a point. Here's the face and there's the point. Again, without, without knowing any kind of measurements, I'm able to put that exactly in position where I want it. But maybe I need to put some bolts in this thing. We go to my tools, a little closer so I can see it. Come over here, touch on the edge so we can, it can pick up the, the half inch. Uh, this time, um, maybe I want it to be three inches. And for the heck of it, I'm going to push screws instead of bolts. And I want the, I want it to be a self-tapping, and I want it to be a little hex on that. I want it to be three inches, and we'll just say okay. And because they were both there, so now I've got two screws that go go through the part. But let's let's move them down a little bit, highlight them both, turn the tri balls on, and move them down. But you know you you, you got a client and, and maybe you want to 
make this a little bit fancier for the client and you like it to maybe that wheel to turn. It's real simple so I go to my animation catalog and I find the, the, the movement that I want to make. So I highlight the part, just drag and drop this to the center and I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this. And let me do this. Let me uh, hide unselected. Oh, maybe I didn't get it right. Let me go here. Here it goes. You see a little white rotational uh, icon. And let me turn everything else back on again. And just make sure. Yeah, okay. So I did, I did get that wrong here. Let me click on that. When I clicked on it the first time, it put a, uh, a, a a rotation off someplace, so I'm just going to delete that. So now I've got a rotation, and let's see how that works. Go, go to my visualization, turn my animation on, and play it. So it, it rotates. It's going a little bit faster than maybe I want to show, so I go to my motion editor. And let's make some more frames. Let's move that up to 100. Now play it again. Moves a little slower. Again, it's it's it it, it it works the way I think in the sense that I want to make that rotate. What do I do? Let me go get a rotation icon, drop it on it, and there it is. The worst case, excuse me, scenario is you're picking the wrong direction, but then you just delete it and you pick something else. That's just a trial and error kind of a thing. Now what I've done here is I've made an assembly all in one file. A lot of the other programs, you can't do that. You've, uh, if, if I'm going to send this to somebody, I have to now send him all the individual parts so that, so that they can, so it reassembles itself when they open up the assembly file. And, and you've been noticing, let me turn that off, that I've been using catalogs a lot. Well, if all of a sudden you've created an assembly and you, you want to keep those parts, so I go to my common, and I just, I just that quick created an assembly, a, a catalog. So I highlight this part, left click, drag it and drop it. It's in my assembly. The same with the base. Click on that, drag it and drop it. And the same with the axle. So I, I just built now parts that I could use. Click on that, drag it out. There it is. Click on this, drag it out. And click on the, the wheel and drag it out. So I've got I've created a library using these parts, and it was just that easy. Now, how do we use the tribal when, when we when we have a bunch of parts and we want to make them into an assembly? Let me go into my tribal here. This this gives you a good idea as to how the tribal can reorient parts without having to worry about coplanar, collinear, and those kinds of things that used to drive us all crazy. So I'm going to reassemble this into a you know, small little assembly. Let's start with this back piece here. I click on the, click on the part, turn my tri-ball on, and I notice the axis of the tri-ball. So I do a, a right click on that, and I say I want that axis to be parallel to an edge. So I tell it I want it to be parallel to that edge there. So now I know that they're in the same planes so far. Highlight that axis, right, left mouse, drag and drop it, 90 degrees. <clears throat> so now I know that I'm, I'm in the same planes with everything, so I know everything is copacetic. Highlight it, turn the tri-ball on, unlock the tri-ball, tell it I want to move the center of that tri-ball to a point. Well, I move it to that point right there. Lock the tri-ball in place, pick the point again, and I move it to another point I want to move it to that point right there. So I just was able to assemble that piece with no constraints. And it's not going to fall apart. You don't need constraints to keep things together. It's not like if I turn this upside down, it's going to fall apart. It, it doesn't work that way. Until, so, until I move that, it's going to stay there. With this part, just the same. Highlight the part, turn the tri-ball on, but it's not facing in the right direction. So I highlight the direction, the axis that I want to rotate it on, 
pull on it slightly. Say I want to go 180 on that. Now, I want to put that peg in that hole, but I want the surface of the bottom of this part to be flush with that surface in there. So turning the tri ball on, I unlock it, hit the space bar, tell it I want to go to the center point of there. So it moves it up. So now when I lock it in place and I tell it move that to the center point of that hole, it moves it where I want it to go. And it's laying flat inside that groove. But again, it's I want it to be in that hole. I want this pin to be in that hole. Again, highlight the axis. Highlight the side that I want the, the, that, the, that the hole is on, and I say, go to a point, and the point is going to be right there. So now I've just put that pin in place with no constraints whatsoever. And the same goes for this here piece. Highlight the part, turn the tri ball on. I want to make this axis parallel to that edge. So now I know that they're in the right order, uh, right configuration position. Now I want to take that <clears throat> the center point there and move it to the center point there. But the keyway is not lined up. So again, highlight uh, I can highlight the direction. And I want it to go to a point, and the point is right there. Again, without constraints at all. And let's go get our pin, turn our tri ball on, and let's highlight that and say I want it to be parallel to an edge. I just find an edge I want it to be parallel to. So now it's it's in place. But again, I want to unlock it, get the center point, move it to a point, pick that point there, lock it in place, high, right click on it, and go to a point again. This time I want to go to a point right there on the corner. So now I was able to assemble this this little piece, whatever it is, uh, without any constraints, only using the tri ball. So that's the power of the tri ball. And probably, if I had to say uh, degree of difficulty, it's learning to use the tri ball because it does so much. is probably one of the more uh, one of the tougher things. You, not tough. It's it's just a matter of using it. But if if it's it's more difficult than just moving things around. You have to understand how the tri-ball works. So now we've covered the Intella shapes, and we've covered the tri-ball. But now I want to show you what smart uh, uh, attachment points are all about. Let me, let me find a blank screen here. All right. So now I have a particular client. Before I before I show you how to do attachment points, I want to show you why you might use them. One particular uh, account of mine. Had, uh, they, they build robotic arms. He was having a problem one day with with mating all these arms together. So he sent it to me, and I helped him work work out the problems. And I decided to use it in uh, in this particular case to show why you might use attachment points. So that's the base, and I put one attachment point at the top of that base, and it's got some constraints on it. So now I take the swivel, left mouse, drag it, drop it. It snaps into place. Return my there you go. So I will also have another attachment point in here for the arm. Grab the arm, drag it, drop it in place. And you can continue to do that until we assemble our our arm. And there's one down in here. Okay. So now we were able to assemble that in just seconds. I didn't have to worry about constraints. I didn't have to worry about mates. I didn't have to worry about the tri ball because I knew where everything went. But because I put constraints on this, I can actually go to my tools, go into mechanization, mechanization mode, and move this around. I'm going to turn off my auto collision so it doesn't stop me. So now I can highlight this, and everything moves. And the constraints keep it all together <coughs> because that's the way it's supposed to move. That's how you can use const uh, mates, uh, smart attachment points. <coughs> Every one of these just has an attachment point and it has a constraints. If we come over here and look in our scene browser, you can see the constraints that I've used 
when I when I built this little uh, uh, little assembly, I built the catalog for him as well. But you might ask, well, how how do we make constraints? Let me show you how to make constraints. Pretty simple. Let's go back to our shapes. So let's let's drag out a block. Drop it on the on the scene. Go to my attachment points on my tools menu. Click on it, and I want to make an attachment point at the top. It's done. I need to name it. So I go to my name feature, and I want to tell it that's a top. But do I want it to be male or female or neutral? In this case, I want it to be neutral. <clears throat> I can also make the constraints here, but I want to leave those constraints off for a moment, and I'm just going to say OK. So now I've, I've got one part done. Let me do this. A cylinder, attachment point, drop it, right click, name, top, and neutral again. So now I've created two attachment points. And let me go to my other catalog here that I created earlier. Drag this, drop it, drag this one, and drop it. So now I'm building a library of parts. I don't need those on the screen anymore. So if I take this part number one, drop it on this on this in my scene, take the part number two, and just touch it on top, it snaps in place. But because I didn't put any constraints on it, I can move it and it and it moves. So let's let's go back and add constraints. Highlight that part, do a right click. And you want to edit the catalog item. It's in a catalog and it's an item. And what it does is it takes that item, fires it up into a, a scene. Turn off ISO. Not like working in ISO. Go back, highlight the part, right click, set the name. And this time I'm going to add it. I want it to be a coincident constraint, and I want to lock it in the x in the z axis. And that's all I do. I exit out of that and I save that. Go to my part number two. Edit the catalog item here. Set the name and add add the two constraints that the others had, and we'll save that. So now if I take the block, drag it, take the cylinder, touch it on top of it, highlight the cylinder, turn the tri-ball on, it's all locked together. Same at the bottom. Turn the tri-ball on, it locks together. So that's how quick and easy it is to make attachment points. But maybe you maybe you don't want constraints um, and, and you want to use attachment points. I have another client who makes um, gymnasium type furniture. Um, you've all seen the Olympics where the, the, the person jumps on the floor and the floor is soft and it bounces. Well, they make all that equipment as well as all these soft little pieces you might see in a, in a kid's gym someplace. But the floor that they make is a spring floor. So let me drag that out. Click on a button down here to show all. So this is one of those floors you might see with all the springs under it. And I've got attachment points on this so that if he wants to configure different configurations, all he has to do is drag it and drop it. And he can actually create a floor. And I don't have to worry about, or he doesn't have to worry about uh, mating them together. And he can, he can create the floor that he needs because each gym is going to be different. Each client of his is going to be different. And that's what attachment points do. But what they also do, let me give you this here, is I, I have a, a, a main mat. So I drop the main mat in the scene, and he wants to configure a, uh, a, a gym for a client. He can now take some of the stuff that he builds and drag it and just drop it on the surface 
and it snaps to the center. But what, what it does is it snaps to the and it's and it's on top of the mat. If I were just to take this and drop it on the scene, it's above the mat, and it, he would have to now move it. And it's it's it just makes it for added time. So then you would just turn the tri ball on, move that to where you want it to go, take another another thing, drag it, turn the tri ball on there. Get too many things going here. Okay. There we go. And move that over here. So he can continue just touching the, the drives at location and move that over here. So all I'm doing here is I'm using the attachment point to place the items on top of the mat. And just depending on what you're trying to do. And in, in one particular case, uh, he has a, uh, a piece of equipment that actually unfolds. So it, it, he thought maybe it would be nice to be able to show them, show somebody how that piece unfolds. And that's so he can he kind of make it a little bit of an instruction kit out of it. Again, to show how you open up the mat and, and maybe you move it around. Uh, and in, in, indeed, we have he has pads. Let me let me move this out of the way. Turn this off. Let me move this out of the way. In this case, we have a pad, but the pad has attachment points on it. So if you want you want to make it into a, a larger pad, they just snap together. So that's why you would use attachment points. It helps you build configurations and assemblies without without having to move things around. They automatically snap to where they're going to go. And what we've been doing is we've been using a catalog, a library of catalogs. Um, again, to another scene here. If if you happen to be involved in piping, piping, you drop a piece of pipe on the scene. It has attachment points. So you want to do an elbow. All you got to do is touch close to the edge, and it snaps in place. Take another piece of pipe, drag it and drop it. Maybe take a T, touch touch the T to it. Another piece of pipe at the bottom. Maybe I, maybe I want a valve, so I drag it and just drop a valve on it. So it automatically knows how to place itself. Hey, Robert, I just want to give you a heads up that we're getting close yes, to the hour mark. So. Yep. Yep, I'm going to move over to the compose, and I won't take a lot of time there. But okay. that's what attachment points are all about. Thank you for reminding me, Steve. Now, compose. So, so, so what we've done, I showed you all the IntelliShapes. I showed you the tri-ball, the smart attachments, and the catalog. Those are the items that make me a faster modeler. But we might have a sales force out there. And the sales force... Um, you, know, you want them to sell your products. So it, the first thing you can do is give them this free this free, free viewer and it'll allow them to look at their parts, the 3D model, in this free viewer. And if it happens to have an animation associated with it, you can see how the animation works. So that's also good for your the sales force and your distributors. And this is what I really like about it. If I go to if you happen to be, in this case, building, uh, you know, you, you, you sell or you distribute um, office furniture paneling. So let me go to my panel here. So I have different shapes here that I could, I have a panel, so I can go with, I, I've already started this so it wouldn't take so long. I just drop a panel there, it puts it in place, drop another, another anchor point, take this, drop it in place. So I can actually go to go to the, go to my client in the field with the uh, the sales force and have the sales force build things without having to worry about having to know how things snap together. And when you're all done with this, you know, and your client signs off on it, 
you then come up to, and, and this is one of the things I loved about this, I've never seen any other viewer do this f for, for a, a client. So I've configured this, I go to my query custom properties, and now it tells me the part number, the description of it, how many quantities I've already put into it, the cost of each, it sums it up for me, and it tells me who the manufacturer is. That is a viewer that I've never used before. I've used viewers for the AutoCAD, the SolidWorks, the Inventors, all the other viewers out there, they did not do this for me. And this is free. So if you were, if you had, if you were in a situation where you build things that are configurable, you could actually make a catalog in IronCAD, send the catalog out with the composed product for free to your sales force or your distributors, and they can, in front of their clients, configure an assembly and then get the cost for it, save it as a, save it, uh, as a BOM, you can, you can save it to a CSV file or CVS file, bring it up into a spreadsheet and do more work with it there. Or even uh, it even works with it was an EDM system, Steve. I think it was. So. Yeah, sorry, I was a mute. Uh, yeah, we can, no, okay. can also integrate using our uh, API to talk to EDM systems. So without taking too much more of your lunch time, I this is what Compose is all about. Really, really nice program, and it's free, um, and it comes with IronCAD as as well. So, so those are the things that I wanted to show people today, that things that make me a better modeler. Um, what I found was I was able to model three times faster with IronCAD than I could using my old SolidWorks system. And once I saw that, I thought, my God, this is nice. And so that's why I'm showing you to, uh, today just these features. IronCAD has a way bunch of other features when, in it. But those are the things... These are the things I wanted to show that make me a better modeler. So if they make me a better modeler, I thought they would make other people a better modeler as well. And that's kind of it, guys. Uh, I, I hope it was informative for you. Um, we're recording this, and I'm going to be putting it up onto my uh, YouTube channel. If anybody has any questions, you all have my email address. Uh, please you know, get hold of me. And if I have to show you some additional features, I'll be glad to. No problem whatsoever. Thank you, everyone, for attending uh, today. Um, it's really nice doing it this way. I can talk to a lot of people without having to go out to all their sites. This is, this is a great way of doing things, so the Internet does have its advantages. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for coming today. And please, uh, I'll be contacting each one of you, hopefully uh, sending you with some information, and we can talk more. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.